This video was brought to you by Nebula. Going into 2024, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak probably thought that the worst had passed. Party disunity had died down, the economy looked to be making a bit of a recovery, and Sunak probably thought that polling had bottomed out. Unfortunately for Sunak though, that's not quite how things have panned out. In fact, just over the past week or so, we've had two devastating polls for the Tories. One suggesting that the Tories were on track to win just 169 seats at the next election, which would be the steepest collapse for a governing party since literally 1906, and another suggesting that Sunak's Conservatives were polling at just 20%, an astonishing 27 points behind Labour, and just one point better than the Tories were doing under Liz Truss, who fell to a low of 19% in October of 2021. Now, obviously, a lot of this bad polling is driven by the Tories and their record in government over the past 13 years. But it's also driven by Sunak, who's become increasingly unpopular. YouGov polling from December suggests that Sunak now has an astonishingly miserable favourability rating of negative 49, nearly as low as Boris's during Partygate, while Morning Consult gives him an approval rating of negative 36, making him one of the least popular leaders in Europe. In fact, things got so bad that on Tuesday night, former Conservative Minister Simon Clark came out publicly to demand that Sunak resigns, the second Tory MP to do so publicly. In his statement, Clark claimed that uninspiring leadership is the main obstacle to our recovery, and warned that Tories were facing, quote, election massacre. So in this video, we're going to try and figure out, quite simply, why is Sunak, who was considered until recently the Tories' best chance at winning a fifth term, so unpopular? Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Now, we're going to split this video into two parts. In the first, we're going to be diving into the specifics of Sunak's polling before trying to come up with some reasons to explain Sunak's polling collapse. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that when Sunak became Prime Minister, he wasn't actually doing too badly in the polls. YouGov polling, for example, found that voters overwhelmingly considered Sunak to be more decisive and effective than the wider Conservative Party. And about a month after he became Prime Minister, Sunak had a net strength rating of negative 11%, which, when you compare it to the negative 48% strength rating for the entire Conservative Party at the time, doesn't look half bad. Similarly, Sunak was also considered significantly more trustworthy and significantly more competent than the wider Tory party. So the big question when Sunak first took office was whether the Tory polling average would converge upwards to meet with Sunak's, or whether his polling average would converge downwards to meet theirs. Unfortunately for Sunak, it seems fairly obvious at this point that the latter is what happened. When we look at strength in particular, there's only an 8% difference between Sunak and the Tories as of January. In fact, more in common polling found that only 26% of respondents now think that the Prime Minister is an asset to his party, down from 37% back in October of last year. But why is this the case? Why do people see Sunak as weaker, less trustworthy, less competent, and less of an asset to his party now than they once did? Well, as we see it, there are two main reasons. Sunak's media struggles and the lack of overall strategy. When he first came to power, people only really knew Sunak as the man who was in charge of the Treasury during COVID. He was the guy who gave away money via the furlough scheme and subsidised people's restaurant trips via Eat Out to help out. At the time, he was also widely considered to be a savvy media performer, with a unique social media presence and a better than average understanding of the details behind his policies. But while Sunak was clearly a likeable figure when he was being showered in praise for giving away loads of money, he's not so great at taking criticism. This isn't intended as a partisan point, by the way. It's just what polling suggests voters think. In interviews, Sunak often gets defensive when he's criticised, which is quite a lot at the moment. And he has a habit of seemingly unintentionally pulling faces 
when someone is saying something he doesn't agree with on phone-in shows. He's also endured a series of gaffes recently, including apparently not knowing how to use a contactless card and saying in an interview with Elon Musk that people should be willing to give up regular pay in order to start their own companies. Similarly, while he developed a reputation for being relatively social media savvy during the pandemic, he's suffered quite a few major social media gaffes recently. He put out an odd clip with Tory right-winger Lee Anderson earlier this month, only for Lee Anderson to resign from government a few days later because he wanted the Rwanda bill to be toughened up. And a couple of days ago, he launched a Cameo-like service on social media that allows people to get personalized videos, only for someone to create one for Nigel Farage, which included Sunak telling Nigel that he thought immigration was too high. You get the idea then, Sunak isn't quite as good a media or social media performer when he's on the defensive, which, as I said, happens quite a lot at the moment. But the second reason he's been seen as unpopular is that he seems to flick between wanting to be seen as a competent technocratic leader and wanting to be a right-wing populist akin to Boris Johnson. When he first took office, Sunak was keen to stress that he was the sensible candidate who would get the economy back on track. He was economically literate, cautious and professional, just what the country was calling out for following Johnson and Truss. But as time went on, and as Tory polling failed to improve, Sunak clearly started worrying that this wasn't exciting enough to win over the right of his party. This, combined with the rise of Reform UK, who are currently polling on 12%, clearly prompted him to change tack and lean into what we might describe as a more populist style. He started saying things like that he was going to stand up for our women, became notably obsessed with small boats, and push the Rwanda scheme much harder. The thing is that he's not simply moved from being a technocrat to a populist. He's seemingly flitting between them week by week. In the midst of the Rwanda scheme, he brought former One Nation Prime Minister David Cameron back into his cabinet, widely perceived as a centrist conservative technocrat. Then, a week or so later, he tried to use the Islington lawyer line, one of Boris Johnson's favourites, against Keir Starmer, only for it to fall appallingly flat. Ultimately, it seems that he's trying to appease everyone, and he's actually only succeeding in appeasing no one. All in all, while Sunak has clearly inherited a difficult situation, he hasn't really helped it either. And the renewed infighting we've seen this week only bodes badly for the Conservatives headed into the next election. You've no doubt been following along with the news from Israel and Gaza, but if you want a better understanding, to dive deeper into the history of the region, then you should check out Real Life Law's hour-long documentary about the tensions and fighting between Israel and Gaza going back decades. It's a superb way to brush up on the history of this region, giving colour and context to what's happening right now. That video, by the way, is part of Real Life Law's Modern Conflicts series, where they regularly run through major ongoing conflicts, from Lebanon's civil war to everything going on in Myanmar and the Turkish-Kurdish conflict. It's an incredible series, and it's exclusively available on our streaming service, Nebula. As you likely know, Nebula is the streaming service that we built with a bunch of our creator friends, and is home to tons of smart educational content. The best part is that by signing up, you not only get access to exclusive series like Modern Conflicts, China Actually from Polymatter, or The Logistics of X from Wendover Productions, it also directly supports TLDR. That's because you signing up contributes to the budgets of these big documentaries and helps us to grow and expand our ambitions. So if you want to sign up, use the link below because that not only supports us directly, but it also gets you a Nebula annual plan for 40% off. That's less than £2 a month, which is an incredibly good price for an independent streaming service, which not only supports creators, but also provides you with tons of ad-free exclusive content. Anyway, thanks for your support and for backing Nebula.